familiar in form and function to anyone familiar with the campaign process because crisis planning is simply a specialized type of campaign. Certainly crisis response involves critical decision making that works to balance the nature of the crisis, the organization and stakeholders in order to create a strategic set of messages that help an organization manage its crisis issues. Effective crisis response involves the identification of critical objectives for the crisis, targeted stakeholders, identification of key messages, as well as the platforms to communicate. Most of what we do in crisis communication follows the same form and function that any other strategic communication effort does. It's just that it's driven by a different set of objectives. However, these objectives still need to demonstrate ROI and be connected to an organization's KPIs, as we've previously discussed in other podcasts. But given the number of tactics that an organization has and the factors that can influence them, it's not surprising that there could be a lot of ways to approach crisis response and many different ways to adapt the messaging. However, consistency and clarity is always important. However, crisis planning also goes beyond just a communications function. It is a strategic management function. However, because communication strategy is central to crisis planning, much of the coordination of the strategy ends up falling within the responsibility of communication experts. However, as we've discussed throughout the podcast on issues management, we have to coordinate with the departments and the functional areas of expertise that would be addressing the problems materially. You'll see a strong connection to the work that was done during the issues management phase because in practical terms, issues management informs the crisis plan and so crisis plans need to be living documents. Like I mentioned in the previous podcast, the oil industry fundamentally failed to think of their crisis plans as living documents, and when we saw the cut and paste jobs across most of the companies in the industry, they had created their crisis plans for operating in Arctic environments and never bothered to update them. What this also means is that operational crisis plans should be concise documents and not treatises on the topics. Now that said, there will have to be a lot of documentation in the background, but the plan itself should be a concise playbook for the organization. The framework that I provide is a sketch for a start of the process. There's no really right or wrong way to write a crisis plan, so what I'm giving you are all the possible tools and components. From there, you have to make good judgments about what should be included based on what's relevant for the organization and the situation. Step one to writing the crisis plan is the risk summary. Now, hopefully this looks familiar from the issues management process. What should emerge from the issues management and stakeholder mapping processes are a continually evolving set of recommendations that identifies and summarizes issues, evaluates issue severity, identifies recommended activities, both material actions and communication strategies to mitigate risks, and provides issue tracking and reporting over time. Unless these are reported in succinct and clear ways, then they're less likely to be acted upon. So while there should be brief narratives to contextualize the issue summaries, much of the information should be digestible at a glance. The way this is communicated can certainly vary, but simple table summaries or visualizations are a very good starting point. In step two, we have contingency planning. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all crisis plan. Crisis plans need to be customized for different types of crises and potentially different operational environments. So a crisis plan for a transgression is going to look different from a crisis plan for a disaster, economic downturn, or internet rumor. But there's a balance to be struck. It's not realistic to create a separate crisis plan for each and every individual crisis or issue that an organization may face. The crisis plan should provide a framework for approaches to the major types of crises, but then customizable for the particular operational realities of the different types of crisis within that overall classification. We should always think of this as contingency planning. The more we know about our stakeholders and the key factors that influence a crisis, the better we can plan for the contingencies and the differences between transgressions, events, disasters, and reputational attacks. So while each crisis will be unique, the development of this document should serve as a generalized structure with core messages for each crisis type. These core messages should be adapted and developed as specific situations unfold and more information becomes available. 
So for each of the four contingency plans, the following information should be captured, summarized, and routinely updated. Now, how often is the routine update required? Well, it depends. And I know that's a great politician's answer, but it really depends on the changes in the environment, the organization, current events, and so on. But generally, active issues management programs will include and provide an evidence-based guideline for the need to update any of the contingency plans. Within contingency planning, there are eight parts. In part one, there should be a very brief and high-level summary of the type of crisis so that people who are not crisis experts can understand what's at stake, and that should include the following types of information, all relative to the organization or industry. So a clear definition of the crisis type, relevant recent major examples of the crisis type, summary of the risk or threat posed by the type of crisis, priority this kind of crisis should take, and identifying the types of responsibilities the organization has in managing this type of crisis. For example, what kind of material crisis response, internal stakeholder management, external stakeholder management are the types of responsibilities that we're talking about. The purpose of part two is to identify the owners for each of the key crisis responsibilities that you identified in part one, and the people, by position or name preferably, who should be viewed as part of the first responders team to this type of crisis for the organization. Frankly, this can be a simple table identifying the responsibility, owner, contact information, and bullet point the rationale for why they're appropriate as the responsibility owner. In part three, we identify trigger points. Based on the intelligence developed as part of the issues management process, the most likely triggers for each of the types of crisis should be identified and briefly explained. The trigger point should indicate when the contingency plan for each crisis type should be activated. In part four, we provide a high level situational assessment. As organizations address crises, they must understand the nature of the problem posed by the crisis in order to begin to build a position on the problem itself. So this section will highlight the most likely problems the organization faces in this kind of crisis and evidence of the relevance to the organization and the situation. This section should also identify key problems underlying the triggers for the crisis, that is, what is likely to have happened in order for the crisis to be triggered. To build the credibility of the situational assessment, including references for each of the type of problems, causes, and representative examples of that type of crisis in the organization or industry is generally recommended. In part five, connect the relevant stakeholders to the problem. So take the problems identified in part four, then indicate the stakeholders that are likely to be affected and typically use a table for this. So match up the critical problems, citing of evidence of the relevance of the stakeholder group to the problem. Then you wanna make sure that you categorize the stakeholders relationship to the organization as well and cite evidence of that relationship. Then finally, rank the stakeholders relevance to the problem and add stakeholder groups as appropriate. What this is doing is it's connecting the issues management process with the stakeholder mapping process and providing evidence that the organization has about the stakeholders relationship to the issue or problem and the organization. Once a summary of the stakeholders involved in the situation is provided, it's also important to identify how the stakeholders and their concerns ought to be prioritized in responding to the issue. So the narrative for this should rank the stakeholders based on the most important stake in the crisis and briefly explain the stakeholders' key concerns. For example, are they directly related to the problem? Um, do they, are there factors that are gonna affect this, including health, culture, identity? But it's important that all of this throughout is evidence-driven and that you cite the evidence throughout. In part six, action recommendations are taken. Once the team, problems, and stakeholders are all identified, the organization must identify and prioritize actions that ought to be taken at the onset of the crisis. So you provide an overview of the best types of actions the organization can and should take in order to provide material support. Remember, actions can include the material actions, but they can also include the communicative ones. 
So part of the process about this is defining the roles and assumptions about the importance of those roles as the crisis emerges. Examples of the types of roles that could be adopted include, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but a bit of a summary one, but it can include leading the material problem solution where that's relevant, a clarification of the industry standards and organization's compliance needs, um, identifying the protector of the organization, identifying activists for the organization and providing advice, identifying the spokespersons, uh, gathering and analyzing situational information, how the organization should go about communicating with members of the organization itself, offering guidance how the organization should communicate with the media or other agencies. So there's a list of ideas and a list of actions that the organization can take, and it has quite a range. But compiling the recommendations from the risk register, the roles that are needed with research on this type of crisis, and so you create a concrete and tangible list of actions that should be taken, identifying the urgency and importance of each, the role to support it, and most importantly, the resources required in order for the organization to take action. In order to successfully respond to the crisis, the organization should have an agile crisis response strategy ready to deploy. This should involve an initial crisis response as well as an overall set of response strategies and primary messages. Remember that initial crisis response should be based on the following best practices. Providing an initial statement as soon as possible, and that's really within the first hour. Being accurate in reflecting facts related to the situation. Being consistent by keeping spokespeople informed of the crisis and key messages. Making stakeholder welfare a top priority using all available communication channels, communicate empathy if people are affected, and being ready to provide and direct stakeholders to trauma and stress response units. Identify and summarize then the theories that would be most relevant to helping the organization structure its initial talking points for this type of crisis by providing a brief summary of each of the recommended theories. So to do this, you would include, you would name the theory, you would identify the key target factors. So for example, EPPM targets susceptibility, severity, and efficacy in order to help develop messages and ensure that people can enact danger control responses and avoid fear control responses. Then in identifying that, you should identify the measurable objectives in the crisis response. And this should serve three functions. First, to identify how the crisis response will demonstrate a return on investment. Second, identify how the crisis response is aligned with the organization's KPIs. And third, identify how the crisis response is aligned with the organization's mission. After that, you would identify the crisis-related tactics. And it's necessary to have initial talking points to address the situation. And for each talking point, it needs to identify the talking point's relevance to the situation or problem, the stakeholders the talking point is directly addressing, the information that will be needed to support the talking point, and the appropriate platform or platforms for communication or engagement. See, the objective of this part is to develop the organization's playbook to respond to the crisis. It should provide an adaptable set of options for the organization to enact from the communication standpoint. So a couple of common questions that I'm asked include, should the playbook include multiple theories? Yeah. Because as we discussed, different theories target different crisis response needs. But the playbook should focus on the most appropriate approaches based on the convergence of the situation, stakeholders, and organization's position. A second common question that I'm asked is should the key talking points mix and match from across different theories? And I would say a cautious no. Crisis responses should be well aligned across different stakeholders. Using a single theory to guide talking points ensures message alignment to different stakeholders tailored to the situation. However, situations can change, so it may be necessary as a crisis develops to change the strategy. As I noted earlier, being able to respond quickly and strategically to a crisis improves the potential success of the crisis response strategy. Likewise, it can help 
ensure that the organization establish itself as a credible source of information throughout the crisis. Having samples of key messages prepared ahead of time for each of the potential response strategies identified gives the organization a decisive advantage in ensuring its initial crisis response is as successful as possible, aligned with the organization's objectives, and builds the organization's credibility. These will, of course, have to be adapted to the particulars of the situation, but it will make the initial response effort more efficient, aligned, and polished. Recommended message samples to have ready for each strategy would include a one to two minute statement about the situation, a brief backgrounder on the organization's history with the issue and the stakeholders, a sample fact sheet, a sample press release, a sample social media post, and I would say, suggest one customized for each outlet used by the organization, and relevant visual materials or multimedia materials. Of course, these can be adapted, but they should be fully written out because it's much easier to revise in order to adapt to a particular situation than to write on the fly. The whole point of the crisis plan is that it's a sketch that gives the starting point and identifies the key factors organizations can control during a crisis. It's not a document that's written in stone and should never be viewed that way. It is a living document, but it's one that needs to be useful and adapted. So there is a considerable amount of customization based on the organization, industry, and situational needs.